Good morning. Oh, there we go. Good morning. Welcome to Hopewell Christian Fellowship this morning. We are so glad you're here this morning. Beautiful. Spring has finally arrived. And um, you chose to be in the house of the Lord this morning. So as we come, we just thank God for the newness of life, for everything that's breaking out all around us. And you know what? It reminds us that God always makes things new again. So, Lord, as we come to you this morning, we thank you that you bring life. That's who you are. And even though the winter may last longer than we want it to, life has to break forth because that's who you are and that's what you do. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness. Lord, as we worship you today, Lord, I pray that life would be breaking forth in us, that newness of life that you have purchased by your own blood. We praise you, Lord, and we welcome you in this place. Let's stand and worship the Lord together this morning.
worship you, Lord. We give you praise. You are worthy, 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 Lord. Christ died on the cross. 
cross for your sin. But what this song is proclaiming is it wasn't just for your sin. It was for your healing. It was for your, your mind, your wholeness. It was, <laughs> it was so that you could have right relationship with one another. It's so that every curse, not just sin itself, but every curse that has been brought on by sin is reversed at the cross through the blood of Jesus. So now you understand why we sing about blood. Because that blood that was shed is the blood that should have been our blood. But guess what? In Christ, it is ours. Because everything that he has done, he has done for us. We need only to receive it. So as we go through this song, let's go through it once more. And I want you to just thank God for what he's done for you. Because God wants to apply that blood to your life this morning. sing this song just claim your healing okay if it's not listed here it's covered here <laughs> and your blood heals every disease right now and your blood it sets the He declared it is finished. His blood had accomplished what needed to be accomplished, reversing the curse, making a way for us to return to God, paying the penalty for sin, restoring us to fellowship with God, creating, as it were, a new humanity in Christ, a new humanity, new creation, a new start, leading to a new heaven and a new earth. that 
that stream, somewhere between the payment and the fulfillment, being transformed day by day, more and more, into his image and likeness. And as we worship the Lord, as we, as we come and we give our adoration to the Lord, that's part of our transformation process. Just focusing on, on what it is we are becoming because we see Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your goodness, Lord. Accomplish that in us. Accomplish that in us, even today, even by your spirit. Praise the Lord. Welcome to Hopewell Christian Fellowship this morning. We're so glad you're here. Would you turn and greet someone this morning? Welcome them into the house of the Lord. Welcome to Hopewell Christian Fellowship this morning. We're so glad you're here. Want to let you know, uh, ladies, you've been hearing some wonderful creative announcements about the ladies' retreat. From what I understand, that is building momentum. Registrations are coming in, but here it is. This is actually the last day to sign up for that. So there are brochures in the foyer. We need your registration and your payment today to go along on the women's retreat. Guys, you'll have to wait till October. Right. Next Sunday is Family Sunday. We look forward to, uh, well, we're gonna have our children in the service with us. Matt and Bambi, who lead the elementary children's ministry, are going to be uh, uh, are conducting that service and uh, Pastor Harold is preaching next Sunday, so an awesome time. Just know that uh, kids are going to be in here next Sunday, and we're looking forward to a great time of celebration together. Also, um, raising money for the women's ministry, there are pretzels on sale in the lobby, and um, it had kind of gotten out that those were by donation. Actually, the donation is a dollar, so <laughs> if... Uh, if you were wondering, yeah, it's a dollar. Um, also, want to make mention Hopewell Summer Camp's coming up. Um, wonderful time at camp. We got some. We got some of our own helping out with counseling this year. Um, uh, Martin and Jonas are helping out with that. We got Cindy and Matt and Bambi, a bunch of them helping out with kids. Uh, with first teen camp in June and then junior high camp in July and kids camp in August. This is a great time. Not only do these kids have fun at camp, but they meet Jesus. And it is a powerful time of transformation. Looking forward to being part of that, but pick up your camp brochures in the foyer and get your kids signed up for that. All right. I think that's it for announcements. Ushers, if you would come and receive the offering this morning, let's uh, worship the Lord in our tithes and offerings. So glad to have Pastors Kurt and Anita back after a, a week of refreshment. So look out, here comes the fire. <laughs> Lord, we thank you for your goodness. We lift up our prayer request to you this morning, and we thank you, Lord, that the blood of Jesus that we sang about is more than enough for every request, for every need, for every person. Lord, most of all, in these requests, we know that there are people with a lot of needs, but Lord, we want them to experience Jesus. We want them to have an encounter with you, Lord, so that as you're bringing healing, Lord, they would see your power and they would be drawn into relationship with you. 
Lord, we pray that those who are needing provision, not only would you provide for them, Lord, but that you would also show them that you are their provider. They would come into a relationship with you and that they would learn to trust you with their whole heart. Come, Lord Jesus, meet every need. Lord, what we give this morning, Lord, we give out of gratitude, thanking you, Lord, not just for what you've done, but for who you are. And so we share, Lord, of what you've given us as a token, as a, a way of representing that it all belongs to you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for the blessing of your presence, Lord. Bless Pastor Kurt as he brings the word this morning, Lord, and I pray that you would communicate the living word to us through it. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Testing, whoop, there we go. You know, I have found more and more often it helps when you push the button. <laughs> Sometime soon I'll get that. <laughs> yeah, well, good morning. Yeah, it's great to be together. And welcome to Hopewell, everybody who's here. And, you know, I just want to say we're not just a, a church here, but we're a church family. And I believe that churches should be more like a family. We don't want to be just distant. I, you know, I grew up, maybe some of you did too, went to a church where you walked in, you sat quietly, you were done in, I said 45 minutes, somebody said 30 minutes, and you walked back out, and maybe you smiled at somebody. And you did that for year after year after year, and you didn't know anybody. Well, I don't consider that church. It, I think it's better to have a relationship together. Can I have a little less volume, guys? <clears throat> well, this morning I want to talk about a subject that's important for all of us. Um, as we go through our lives and as we are uh, in this point in time, 2018, that we also keep the future in mind as well as the present. And so I want to talk about, and it's sort of a, an update about the, the end times, but I want to approach it in a totally different way. I felt like the Lord revealed some things I want to share today. And so my, my focus is loving Jesus through the end times. How about that? You know, we so often get focused on all the end times events, right? You know, the great tribulation and all this and all these, you know, things. But, you know, I got a fresh revelation that, that all of those things, while they are important, are not for us as believers. Can you say they're not for me? They're probably wondering, how can that be? Because if you are in Christ... All of those things that we read about are for the world, for unbelievers, and for Israel. Now, do you fit into any of those categories? If you don't fit, then it's not for you. Okay? Can you go, well, I'm glad it's not for me. No, seriously, you know, if you've read the different parts of Scripture, um, you know that as we go more and more toward these end times, and what do I mean by end times for some that may not know? But we know that Jesus came the first time, and that was nearly 2,000 years ago. We know that he spoke very clearly that he was going to be coming again, and that there are many things that point to when that time is going to come, that he is coming again. And so I don't so much want to today talk about the definitiveness of his coming again, that he definitely is. I don't want to talk so much about the events of what it's about, because you've probably heard that. 
But where I want to focus today is about the condition that will be on the earth shortly before his coming. And there's two main passages I want to go into today. Uh, one is in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4, and one is in 2 Timothy chapter 3. And so we want to look at those. But the issue, again, I want to keep coming back to, and I appreciate so much the worship this morning, that, that the, the, the essence of the worship this morning was about how God surrounds us and how he keeps us. You know, he surrounds us, he keeps us. He didn't save you and me for destruction. Come on, right? And so we've got to look at even the end times events from the standpoint that, that God loves us and is going to keep us. And no matter what happens, um, I just believe we're going to be watching it from a distance. And therefore, that takes on a whole different perspective about all the end times. And the key is that we keep our eyes on the king and the kingdom and not on all the circumstances. That's good. You ought to write that down somewhere. I want to keep my eyes on the king and the kingdom and not on the circumstances. You know, what do you see in the news? It's the circumstances that you see in the news. But what are we to keep our eye on? The king and the kingdom. Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then all these things will be provided for you. This week, as we were away for a time, as Pastor Joel mentioned, and we were um, up in the area of Lake George in the Adirondacks, and we had a wonderful first day of springtime up there with snow and ice on the ground and it being about 20 degrees. And I said, thank you, Lord, for spring. <laughs> I said it in faith, of course. But one of the things that comes to mind is that um, we were away from television. I normally don't watch much television anyway, but we were away completely from television the entire week, you know, from Monday all the way till Friday. And then Friday we went to dinner. And did you ever notice anymore when you go to dinner that these restaurants they cannot operate without a television anymore. And not just one, you have to have three. And they all have to be on different stations or different topics that are all conflicting with each other. Well, I'll tell you what, as we were sitting there and it was, uh, I don't know, it was an ESPN channel or something that was on the one television, you know. And I, I felt myself go from this place of like perfect peace this whole week. And all of a sudden I could feel like, this anxiety is starting to rise, and we're having a beautiful time there at dinner, and, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to avoid watching. Do you ever try to avoid watching a television? You know, you almost have to go like this or something. I don't know. But anyway, we had a wonderful time with my beautiful wife here. We had a wonderful dinner. But what I'm just referring to is the fact that, that in that little bit of time, it began to stir me already and agitate me. And, you know, today anymore, news is sold if they can agitate you. It's not sold for the purpose of news anymore. It's sold for the purpose of money. And money comes from the standpoint that if they can agitate you or if they can get you worked up, then you're going to look for more news because, because you got worked up about that. Now you need to know what the next news is so you can get worked up about that so you can find out what the next news is. And get work. I mean, the whole thing is a crazy cycle. You know, our young people, there's, there's now a new... I forget what the, the name exactly, but there's now a new medical diagnosed, I don't know what you would call it, condition I'll call it. And they actually have a name for it where, where the, the young people will go into an anxiety attack. Maybe it's not just young people, maybe you hear it too. An anxiety attack if you have to put your cell phone away. Did you know about that, Lauren? Yeah. I just saw they have a name for it now. So we're, we're just, we're in a society that is just going so fast. And the question is, where are we going? Where are we going to? And the Bible really gives us answers to that. And that's what I'm referring to about the end times. And you'll see two terms that kind of come out together. One is the end times, and basically we have been in the end times since the time of Pentecost, right after uh, Jesus um, 
a resurrection and Pentecost came. We've been in what's called the, the age of the church or the church age uh, since that time. So you'll see that terminology used, but you'll also see the term last days. And if you see the term last days in the scriptures, what it's, what it's really correctly saying in the Greek is it's the last bit of the last days. When you see last days, it doesn't mean, oh, yeah, you know, that could be centuries, that can be, you know, whatever, millenniums. No, that's not, we're in the very end point of the last days. And, and how do I know that? Well, I want to show you some things. But again, what I show you today is to show you what Jesus told us is going to come so that we can actually continue in love with him as he continues in love with us and that we keep our eye on the king and his kingdom because that's where we are now. We're in his kingdom now as believers and we're going to the rest of the fulfillment of his kingdom when we stand with him in glory and in that place with him. And so three places really um, give us a great insight to the end times events and I'll just mention these but Matthew chapter 24 is kind of a place there are some other portions of scripture that uh, in the other gospels that talk about what's in Matthew chapter 24 but chapter 24 is really the road map of the end times and Jesus gives that to his disciples. I'm going to touch down on that a little bit. But the other two places would be 1 Timothy 4 verses 1 to 5 that describes the conditions on the earth that we can continue, that we can know about them so we can continue to love Jesus throughout that time. And 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 16 describes conditions on the earth uh, also uh, at that time. And so this is important. Um, you know, it's so important that, um, I don't know, this may shock you, but this was a phrase that came to me, but that the, the idea of the end times, but that we're not really a part of the end times, or we're not, we're not caught up in all the ugly details of it, is really a love story with Jesus. I never read end times from that standpoint, <laughs> but the reality is, he doesn't stop loving us, Right? Whether it's now, tomorrow, 10 years from now, is he going to stop loving us 20 years from now? In the good times or the bad times, does it matter? No. So if that's all true, then whenever the last days happen and the events of the last days happen, we're still going to be his beloved. We're still going to be loved greatly by him. And, you know, if you have your beloved, you don't send your beloved into places where they're going to get hurt and messed up. Now, there are missionaries that go out, and I know there's other parts to the picture, and I appreciate that, and I agree with that. And there are missionaries that have gone out. They've given their lives for the sake of the gospel. The amazing thing is, is that where missionaries go out, the blood of the martyrs is the seedbed for revival. And if you go back into history, you'll find in China or different nations that where missionaries went out and they gave their life on behalf of the kingdom, on behalf of Jesus, to lead people to Jesus so that they can come into eternal life, you will find at some point later that that sacrifice begins to turn out, turn into a revival. And you can trace this into many different nations um, through, the, through the years. And so, again, it, it depicts, and this is my emphasis this morning, is that Jesus loves us not only now, he's going to love us all through the end times and all through the last days. So, therefore, I want to just anchor that within you so that you can go, you know what, now knowing that, I can love Jesus all through the last days too. Amen. Matthew 24, you don't need to turn to it. I'm just going to refer to it. Matthew 24, as I said, the whole chapter is really the road map, but I just want to pull this one part out. Matthew 24, verse 30 says toward the end of chapter 24, then the sign of the Son of Man, who is Jesus, and this is Jesus speaking about himself at a later time, then the sign of the Son of Man, which he's speaking about himself, will appear in heaven, and they... The, who is they? They are people that are on the earth, will see the Son of Man 
coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Hallelujah. You know, we, we just overdo sometimes all the aspects of uh, the tribulation. And I, you know, I know we've been all kind of taught those things through the years. But I want to start undoing, unlearning the wrong stuff so I can learn the right stuff. Is that all right? And the more that we fall in love with Jesus, the more we're going to be able to do exactly what I'm talking about this morning. Let's look at just the aspect of love before I go into these other uh, portions of Scripture in 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy, and I don't know how much we'll get through. We'll try to get through what we can this morning, but it's to give you an important uh, foundation for how we need to look at this. I want to just continue in the aspect of love here for a moment. It says, but Jesus, oh, I wrote this, but Jesus really loves you and me. Okay, Jesus said this in his life, that you will have tribulation, John 16, These things I have spoken to you, that in me, in Jesus, you may have what? Peace. You can have what? Peace. How many need more peace? Yeah. But he said that in me, you may have peace. How does that peace come? I believe it comes by a confidence in who Jesus is and a solid relationship with Jesus as a real living relationship and knowing that his authority is greater than any other authority. And when we know those and we put those together, we can go, you know what? I might be going through tribulation, difficulties, whatever, but I know now that Jesus wants me to have peace, and so I'm going to take and have my peace in the midst of this trouble. I'm going to take and, and I'm going to go to sleep in the back of the boat with Jesus while he tends to all the storm and he tends to all the boat, you know, and all the waves and everything. He says, these things I've spoken to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But what does he say? But be of what? good cheer, I have overcome the world. Now, some, some days we wonder, Jesus, are you sure you're overcoming the world? Things are getting pretty bad. But if he said, I have overcome the world, then guess what he means? In the Greek, it means he's overcome the world, okay? And sometimes the battle isn't that the stuff that's going on out there. Sometimes, most of the time, the battle's right here in, in this thing, it's right in our head, and it's right here in our emotions sometimes, that we, we let ourselves get stirred up, and this is where, you know, you can, whatever stirs you up, you know, just turn it off kind of thing. Um, but, you know, one of the goals of, of, of Jesus to his, to his followers is that, that you may have peace, and you have peace by having Jesus, you know, we, we talk about that when we give our life to Jesus, there is a peace that comes into our life. And it's a very real thing, and it stays with us, okay? So he says, be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Well, you know, another way of saying be of good cheer is, I love you, will you chill out? Would you stop fretting? You know, I think it's Psalm 37. It's the Psalm of the frets. <laughs> Fret not when evil men do things. Fret not for this. Fret not for that. So I call it the fret nots, actually. Of... So Jesus is saying, fret not. Okay? Be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. So you might go, but I, I still can't have my peace. Well, that's the issue is it's not about you having it. It's about you connecting with Jesus so he can take what you have and he can then give you what he bought on the, on the cross and that is he can give you the peace. See, if the devil can keep you stirred up, you won't have peace. If you don't have peace, it's hard to pray. If it's hard to pray, you can't connect with the Lord. If you can't connect with the Lord, you don't have peace. And the whole thing goes in a crazy cycle then. Furthermore, Jesus loves you and me very much. And not only Jesus, but the Father does too. John 16, 27 says, For the Father himself loves you. A lot of us have a hard time connecting with 
the father figure in heaven, the, the father who is part of the Godhead. And usually, if that's a difficult thing, usually it's because we have father issues when we were growing up. One of the things that we love to do here at Hopewell on Father's Day is, we've done this in the past, but we've had a message on what does it mean to be a father. And then we've asked for those who are men, who are fathers, that can pray a father's blessing to stand up, to line up all around the room. And then we say to the rest of the people, if you have never had the father's blessing, go to one of these now that they can pray over you. And I'll tell you what, it just transforms lives. If you've never had a father's blessing, we need not only our earthly father's blessing, but that represents our heavenly father's blessing also, that he has his gaze set upon you. 1 John 5, 1, and I'm just still focusing on just how much Jesus loves you, how much the Father loves you. It says, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ, meaning that Jesus is the one who came, the Son of God, suffered, died, and rose again, has been born of God or born again. And everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of him, meaning born of Jesus. And so it's all interconnected that if you love Jesus, then you're going to love the Father. If you love the Father, you're also going to love the Holy Spirit. If you love the Holy Spirit, you love Jesus, and the whole thing goes around and around. But there's also one other dimension, and that is that if you are born again, you not only are called and do love Jesus and the Godhead, but you love one another. It says if you don't love one another, well, I won't go into it. We're called to love one another. Well, pastor, I may love them, but I don't like them. Well, that's your choice. But you're called to love them. You don't get off the hook. And maybe it's not them, but maybe it's you. Whoops. Here's a thought that came to me this week. What don't I know about myself that I need to know so that I can know myself. If you like that, you can have it, no extra charge. Some of you maybe need to ask that question. What don't I know about myself that I need to know about myself so I can fully know myself? And if you ask that question to the Lord, he just might answer it. And you just might be surprised. 1 Thessalonians 4, 17, then we who are alive, talking about the time of his second coming, we who are alive shall be caught up together with them, all others in the clouds, to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always, say always with me, we shall always be with the Lord. Now, does that always stop at the end, before the end times? Does that always have a condition, well, except for, you know, in the uh, great tribulation? No, always still means always. And so I'm, I'm just really trying to drive home the foundation of God's love and that it's never going to stop and that your love is going to be tied with his love and he's going to carry you through if we go through some or whatever part of the end times, the great tribulation, whatever. But even today, it's exactly what we need for right now today. Okay. Let's talk now about second, I'm sorry, first Timothy four, one through three. And the times that we are living in, it's important that we know something about that so that it's kind of a roadmap, you know, of what we're we're living in. Because you might say, Well, how do we know we're anywhere near the end times? Well, my first answer is because the pastor said so, and I'm the pastor. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. How do we know? Well, I'm glad you asked that question. Before I go into the characteristics that are on the screen of the end times, I'm going to give you how I know that I know that I know that I know, and you can too. 
Here are some of the milestones that you need to take note of. First of all, Israel is a nation again. Number one, it's the time clock for all other events. The end times require Israel to be in existence, requires Jerusalem to be the capital. It requires a temple to be built so that the temple can be then be desecrated by the Antichrist. Therefore, Israel has been, um, become a nation again. I believe it's true that no other nation has ever been completely destroyed, the language disseminated throughout the world, and then a nation come back into existence again and actually restore its ancient language. There is no other nation in the earth that, that I've ever heard, uh, you know, described about that. So you might ask, though, and some people have asked me this, but, but we don't need a temple. No, the issue is not that we need a temple. The issue is that people of the Jewish background who don't understand Jesus yet still believe they need to get back to the condition of the temple which was destroyed in 70 AD. There is still this, not only a strong desire, the materials to build the temple are already in existence and they are already waiting to go and be built. The, the um, priesthood, the Aaronic priesthood, as was under Aaron, has already been reinstituted. The, sin, or the spotless lambs and even the, I think, the red heifer, which are needed in certain ceremonies under the old covenant, are, are already been born and already ready to go. Well, I'll tell you what, if that doesn't give you chills enough right there, we need to lay hands on you because... You know, that's already just telling us enough right there. Let's go on, though. Nations are aligning against Israel. Is that news to anybody? You ought to read Ezekiel 38. Ezekiel 38 lays out the, the end times war that's going to happen that includes uh, Gog and the land of Magog, which is Russia and Central Asia. You can read about Rosh, who is Russia, another portion of Russia. You can read about Meshach and Tubal. These are the names given in Ezekiel, which equals Turkey. Does anybody see how Turkey is not friendly? Oh, okay. You're Turkish. All right. Praise the Lord. Bless you. That's awesome. Yeah, so these nations are amazing how they're lining up. Uh, Cush, which is Ethiopia. Uh, Put, which is Libya, North Africa, Iran, Iraq, Eastern Europe. So, you know, so when you see all these things are happening, you know, Jesus said, when you see these things happening, be ready, look up, for your redemption draws an eye. So the nations are aligning. China, which is a part, an end player in end times events, has grown to be a superpower and will be a part of the attack that will come against Israel. Knowledge. We don't need to say much about that. We know we're overwhelmed with knowledge. How many have too much information? TMI, right? Okay. Information, it says in Daniel chapter 12, verse 4, it says information will increase. It means literally that it's going as fast as it can possibly ever go. Well, right now, we're sending information at the speed of light. You know those little electrons? They're running through the wires. You know, they're traveling at the speed of light. You know, your phone calls... That, you know, Fios, you know, get your Fios phone line. Well, that's because they're sending things at the speed of light. 186,000 miles per second. Yeah, that'll kind of put your hair back, you know, at that speed there. Um, travel will increase. Well, we've got travel around the world right now. You can travel to the moon and back. And they're working on traveling to Mars and back. Another piece is there will be a falling away, a great falling away. And I'll get to that in a little bit. What is a falling away? Well, it means, you know, for you to fall away or a person to fall away, it means they had to be a part of what Jesus is doing and then they fell away. Well, I've never seen such evidence in this time period in all of my life as a Christian since 1980, you know, and just, it's just astounding anymore. So Jesus is awakening the church to that. There's going to be an increase of lawlessness. Do you think you have a problem with lawlessness in our nation? Okay. There's going to be the love of many that is growing cold, meaning the love of many for God 
who is going to grow cold. That means people who were even for God are even going to grow cold. There's going to be persecution. Right now, every year, there's more people that are martyred uh, than, than if you add many, many years together in the past. The gospel will be preached around the world, and then the end will come. There's a scripture in Matthew about that. We're, we're virtually there. I don't know, I think there's something like 94% of world languages have some portion of the gospel in them. There'll be a time of calling evil good. We've got that going on. There'll be growing violence. We've got that going on. The revival of the Roman Empire. We've got that in place. The emergence of the Antichrist. He's probably somewhere right now living on an estate somewhere in the world waiting for his time. There will be a covenant with Israel. How many times do you hear about wanting to create peace with Israel? It's like one of the pub most public things is this peace thing. And so there will be a peace agreement, but it will be a false peace agreement. We needed to get to a point where the human race would have the ability to exterminate itself. Well, we're there on that one. If you hear all the different nuclear weapons that, you know, in the, in the, uh, like thousands and thousands of nuclear weapons, you know, we can extinguish ourselves. We can have a great time, probably. We could extinguish ourselves a thousand times over. Yeah. I'm being facetious. You know, we need an end time union of the European nations, which we have. We need instant worldwide communication and God's final witness witnesses because the scripture says in Revelation there will be two witnesses that will be preaching the message of Jesus Christ in the end times and they will be killed and it says that they will be able to be seen around the world you can't have that in any other century before this so the beauty is that while that may be going on in the world we don't need to be of the world. Jesus said, we don't need to be of the world. And so we need what? We need to then fall in love with Jesus all the more. Let me go into 1 Timothy 4 a bit with you. Because this is what now, some of the conditions on the earth, some of them may be what I just covered, but some of the conditions that are on the earth. Number one, believers departing from faith, the true faith. One, I think the Amplified says true faith. I went, whoa, that's interesting. <laughs> there can be many out there who claim that either they're a Christian or they're walking according to the Bible. When you ask them about what it means to be born again, they don't know. When you ask them, how do you know you're walking the true faith? Well, because I pull this little bit. You know, we, we've got the cafeteria-style Christianity today. Do you notice that? People can go and get, well, I'll take this piece of, of the Bible. Um, I'll take this piece over here. Uh, I like the blessings part. Yeah, I really get into the blessings. I don't like the correction part, so I don't use that part of the Bible. It's ridiculous. It's a cafeteria-style biblical or, you know, Christianity today. That's not the Bible. That's not the true faith. And while I believe that, and I'm hoping for and praying for, that we will see a, a worldwide revival, and there's those that are saying that, I also have to be true to the Scriptures. And this is, this is the truth of the Scriptures for these days we're living in. People giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies in hypocrisy. Deception. The enemy wants to come around with deception. And, and deception can be very subtle, so we've, not, we've got to be tuned in to what the Word of God says. We've got to be tuned in also to what Jesus is bearing witness and the Holy Spirit is bearing witness. People having their conscience seared, meaning that there's no regrets for misleading people. Working with some family and friends in trying to help a young man get out of a... Um, I don't want to call it a cult, I guess, but it may be. But certainly it is a controlled condition by a man who acts like he is empowered by God and, and all this kind of stuff. But what's happening is that this leader 
is telling these young people, you need to pray more, you need to not sleep, you need to fast, you need to do this. And what it does is that kind of, that kind of demonic control is weakening people's ability to think clearly and therefore they end up submitting under this wicked control of people and he's supposedly the leader of his ministry and supposedly a Christian. That's not by itself. That's happening all around the world, around this nation even. And so we need to understand these kind of things are going to be happening. There's, there's a, in 1 Timothy 4, it says forbidding to marry, which talks about sexual perversion. You know, we got all kinds of things that are happening today. Commanding to abstain from foods, meaning that we got false ideas or will have false ideas and deceptions about foods. I like the rest of us that says all food is good for the eating, hallelujah, if it's received with thanksgiving and prayer. You know, this is one of the things I don't know a lot of us know, but, you know, when we sit down to have grace over our meal, actually, the Bible doesn't talk about having grace. You, you, can, you can thank the Lord. What it's really intended to, if you go back and read in 1 Timothy 4, 1 through 3, is that you pray over the food, and in the days of the New Testament, there were foods that were offered up to idols and then got over into the, among the Christians. And so they would pray over the food, sanctifying it and breaking off any demonic control over the food through the prayers that they were offering when they offered it with thanksgiving and with prayer. And so I remember years ago, I think maybe I've mentioned the story, but when I was traveling in the business world, another worker and I went down to Chile to South America to Santiago, and um, we were eating similar foods. And, um, and during that time, whenever I went to eat, he was not a believer, I was. And during that time, I would literally have focused verbal prayer and of course, he was not a Christian, but he would, he would be nice. He would just kind of wait till I was done. But anyway, but I would pray over my food, sanctifying it, blessing it, making it health for my body because I can do that with the authority of the scriptures. And I never got sick, and he got dysentery. He got uh, a stomach virus and all that kind of stuff, and he was a mess for several days, and I never got sick during that time. And I just say, thank you, Lord, for that because his word works. We need to pray over our food. You know, in America, it's easy. You know, we have the FDA, ha ha, um, that makes sure every bit of our food is perfectly healthy and sanctified. I think you better pray over it. Let's go over 2 Timothy 3, 1 for a bit. And I'll go through these, trying not to be in a hurry because it's important that, that we see this stuff all around us, but we don't get caught up in it. You know, beloved friends, hear what I'm saying. This is a message of God keeping us out of this stuff. If we will love him and he loves us, he's going to keep us out of this stuff. That's why we need to come to Jesus and we need to come now. We need to come in the day that we're living in. 2 Timothy 3.1, but know this, meaning this is going to happen for certainty, that in the last days, which is the last of the last days, perilous, dangerous, hard times will come. For men will be, and by the way, this is not just about men. You can add women there too. It's not in any way gender specific. I better watch out or I'll get in trouble. For men will be lovers of themselves. And then I added some notes. They will be, they will be f not found, but fond of themselves. They will have no regards for others. Today we hear the term narcissistic, where somebody is just so caught up in themselves and they're so wonderful and all that kind of stuff. You know, it's sort of rampant out there. Lovers of themselves, lovers of money, which it means extreme lovers of money. And we see that happening over and over. Boasters. And I added on TV, both Christian and secular, something in, inside of me just turns sometimes when I see some of the TV that, that, you know, our Christian ministers are putting on out there. It just, it's rather upsetting at times. There will be those that are proud and haughty, 
That's happening. Blasphemers of God and Christians. I don't know if you've ever tried to post something on Facebook that contains something of God and post it publicly. You better put on your armadillo, you know, thick skin because I've been ripped into like I've never heard language before. It's certainly in a public arena. Blasphemers, disobedient to parents, children, but also adults, unthankful all ages, unthankful for the blessings that we have, unholy, meaning wicked in lifestyle and language, unloving, hard-hearted, in this nation that has so much, I see so often hard-hearted people that have been given so much, and it shouldn't be that way. Unforgiving, slanderers, false accusers, their word being untrustworthy, without self-control, brutal, vicious, despisers of those who are good, traitors, betrayers of Christians, headstrong, heady, high-minded, haughty. These are all there. I'm not making them up. These are all listed. Paul listed them for the last days. Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Having a form of godliness, but denying its power. In America, they say from surveys that 70 to 80% of people will say that they're a Christian. 30% go to church other than Christmas and Easter of those 30%. Of the 30%, 10% will say, 15% will say they're born again. And the other portion don't know what it means to be born again, but they claim that they're, you know, a, a good, solid Christian. We've got some serious deception out there. Having a form of godliness, but denying its power. Always learning, never able to come to the truth Resist the truth and men of corrupt minds. These are just even a partial list. And the reason that I bring this up today before you is because this is our times that we're living in. I don't think you have to think too hard about it, right? You can see it pretty much everywhere. And so what does it mean? Well, what it means is Jesus coming isn't too far off. And what it means is, okay, if we're not too far off, then I better get my life right with Jesus. It means I better know that I know that I know that I'm born again. You don't need to be a person that will say, well, you know, do you know Jesus? I hope so. Are you going to heaven? Well, I hope so. No, I don't want you to know that you hope so. I want you to know that you know so. See, when you are born again, something changes in you. The Holy Spirit comes in you and begins to change things from the inside out. Christianity was never meant to be about behavior that you've got to look a certain way, do a certain thing. It was never about that. You don't need to clean up your life. You need to give it to Jesus, and he cleans it up. Because these things can affect us too. All that are listed here, they can affect us too. But if the more we keep our focus on the Lord Jesus Christ, the more we're going to find that these things are not affecting us. The more we fall in love with him and recognize his love for us, the more we're not going to be experiencing these things. Oh, we'll see them. They're out there in the world. But remember what I said. It's not to look at the circumstances. It's to look at the king and his kingdom. You know what you can do is say, Lord, I thank you. Yeah, these things are happening, but I know where I'm headed to. I know there is a heaven that's waiting for me. I know you've got me in your hand while I'm walking on this earth. I know that you love me, and you're going to continue to love me, and you don't stop loving me because I don't do something right. Because, Lord, it's not about my behavior, but it's about what you did on the cross. See, when you know you're a child of God, you're not worried, oh, well, I did this and I must not be that. But, you know, but it's about what was done, what was complete, what will not change because you have been born again by the Spirit of God. Your sins have been not only washed away, they have been, a, they've been done away with. When in the economy of God, when you confess your sins and ask him to forgive you and he forgives you and you can say, Lord, I thank you for forgiving my sins. And then he says that he deposits them as far as the east is 
comes from the west into the deepest place in the ocean. He throws them. And so if you come up and you say, oh, Lord, this sin is still bothering me. And God goes, hmm, what sin was that? I don't recall it. If you do it again, I'll recall it. If you don't ask me to forgive you. But if you did it before, I already forgave you. It's not there. What are you talking about? The biggest challenge today is the enemy trips us up by the things we don't know. Because if we knew the things that we're supposed to know, we won't get hung up in the things that we don't know. And he doesn't have the ground to be able to do it. What do we need to know? And this is what you need to know. And you need to know this love that is unchangeable. I'm going to ask the worship team to come on up. So what do we do? Number one, be aware of these times that we're talking about. But not get hung up in it. Jesus said, you will have tribulation. By the way, I'm believing that that means the great tribulation also, and therefore I can be of good cheer. He didn't say which tribulation. These things must happen, and they are happening now. These things will usher in the second coming of Jesus. Will you love Jesus into and through the last days? That's the question before us. And if you're not sure, then what should you do? Well, three things. Number one, receive a fresh encounter with Jesus as your Savior. That means to take and to recognize what it means to be born again. And if you've not been born again, then get with somebody. We'll have the, the altar ministry team up here. But basically what it means, and you can find it on the back of your bulletin, there's a prayer where we acknowledge our sinful part that, that we have sinned. And then we acknowledge the part of who Jesus is and what he did on the cross. And then we ask him to forgive us. You know, and we talk about um, to, to, to um, what's the word, to, when we turn our, our sins over to him, to repent. And repent nowadays is, is being taught a lot about, well, it means to just change your mind, to change the direction you're going. And I believe that's a piece of it, but the other piece is godly sorrow. You can, you can have a repentance where you turn your direction around, but if you don't have godly sorrow, you're not going to be set free. And so it's a matter of asking his forgiveness with a godly sorrow for our lives and then receiving the new life that he has for us. A fresh encounter with Jesus as Savior. Second of all is you need to fall more in love with Jesus, whether that's through worship, whether that's through getting stuff out of your life. You know, you cannot mix... Uh, you know, bad water with good water. You know, if you take a five-gallon bottle of water, pure water, and if you take an eyedropper of sewage and drop it in there, is anybody going to want to drink the water? No. Because a little bit of sewage and contamination will contaminate the whole thing. And the Scripture talks about that. We've got to get the sewage out of our lives. We've got to get the bags of garbage out of our lives. So many times I was tempted, and I never did this with our kids, but I was really tempted. <laughs> you know, they'd be squawking and whatever, you know, at, at each other, and, and I was tempted to take the garbage bag from the sink, under the sink, you know, tie it up, bring it over to where they're sitting at the table, and just dump it out on the table. I go, you got to get the garbage out of your life. It would make an impression, wouldn't it? <laughs> we need to get the garbage out of our lives. We can't get the blessing of God if we're going to also be living for the devil. You can't do both. Jesus wants to deliver us and set us free. He's given us everything that we need for that. And so to fall more in love with Jesus, we need to get rid of the stuff that takes us away, and we need to increase with things, the more that uh, draws closer to him. Uh, we may have objects in our home that are actually uh, harboring a demonic presence. You may not be aware of that, but I know it for facts, for a fact. 
And so if you ever feel like, you know, I got a funny picture in this, my house, or I got a funny statue, or, or if you've got a little Buddha or something, like, would you please get it out of your house, okay? You know, you cannot, you cannot have something that represents a foreign god. God is jealous, God, he says, you know? So you got to get the junk out of your life. Fall more in love with Jesus. We read with some guys that I meet with about some of the early church leaders, early church fathers in the first few hundred years. And, and as they were literally being burned at the stake or drowned and even during the Reformation years, they would be speaking words of, Lord, forgive them. Lord, they don't know what they do, just as he said on the cross himself. Or they would forgive the people. You know, folks, we, we just have to really come to a deeper understanding of what it means to be a Christian. And not just a Christian. A Christian's a label, but it's really about knowing who we are and going deep in that area. And number three is therefore stay awake for you do not know what day your Lord is coming. And don't get caught up in the people that are trying to predict it. I think there was another one just recently. You know, they, they ought to lock those people up somewhere. No one knows the day or the hour. We've had enough counterfeits. Jesus said, don't go places where they said, you know, here's Jesus or whatever. You know, we need to be very, very, very discerning in the days that we're living in. Amen? All right, let's stand together as we close. If in this message that you've heard today has just really pricked your heart and you know that you need to get some things right with the Lord, I want to ask the altar ministry team to come up a while. But you need to go ahead and come to Jesus. You're not coming to man. You're not coming to the church. But you're coming to Jesus. You're coming to a, a, an encounter with the living God. And I believe that's what's needed more and more in the day we're living in is an encounter. It's not just a head knowledge. It's a true encounter with God. And when you have that encounter, everything changes. I know it was for me when I, when I came to faith the first, I didn't, I didn't know the Lord the first 26 years, or maybe I knew of him and I went to church, but I didn't really know, know him. And, and so when I came to faith on a night when there was a, just a revival meeting going on, and uh, it was my heart was so turned around that I felt like a piece of metal and at the front of the church was like a million megawatt magnet. And I felt like there's only one place I'm going and I was right to the front of the church. And that night I remember repenting of my sins and I remember praying. And I didn't know what I was even necessarily doing, but I knew it was the right thing to do. When you go to Jesus, there's no wrong thing. Amen? He takes care of everything in our lives. So if that's you today, then just come on up. See one of the, the ministry teams here that they can pray. But if you also need something else, you need prayer for healing, you need something else that you want to stand in prayer for, then come on up. We have a number of people that are here that want to pray with you. So let's close in this song. And during the song, please come on up and feel free to come and just receive prayer here today.
you that, that you are wrapping your arms around us. That, Lord, I thank you that you have all the things worked out for all eternity. And so, Lord, as we give ourselves to you, we have that safe place that we can come to, that place where you are our everything, our all in all. And in every situation, you are there. Whether we know it at the moment or not, you are always there in that situation. And Lord, that you will continue to guide and lead us and love us. So Lord, may our love now be secure in you also. That whatever comes, whatever may, Lord, we will always love you and we'll continue to love you as you love us. May that be our cry today, Lord. Bless you. We thank you, Lord. I pray now your blessing over each one as we go today, that you bless them today with your presence. Bless them, Lord, that you would even show up in special ways in each one's life here today. And so, Father, I give you thanks for all that now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you as you go today in Jesus' name.